Uh, my name is Mark Smith. I'm the VP of Animal Care at the New England Aquarium, and it really is a true pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Nick Whitney, who's a senior scientist at the Anderson Cabot Centre for Ocean Life. So Nick's journey into the science of sharks began as an undergraduate at Albion College in Michigan. We have some Albion College alums here. Yeah. I think that's the Midwestern politeness that's so famous. Um, so while Nick was in Michigan, he studied nurse sharks in the Florida Keys. He went on to earn his master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Hawaii, where he studied several shark species, including tiger sharks and white tip reef sharks. He then joined the postdoctoral science team at the renowned Moat Marine Laboratory. And now we are very pleased and privileged to have Nick join the team of shark biologists at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life right here at the New England Aquarium. Nick's scientific research focuses on the movement, behavior, and physiology of marine animals, especially sharks. He pioneered the use of accelerometers to monitor the movements of sharks. And you can think of accelerometers a bit like Fitbits. They precisely sense the animal's movements in three dimensions, the tilt, roll, turn, and diving. And Nick was the first to deploy accelerometers on wild sharks and has since deployed them on many other aquatic species, including sea turtles. The data that Nick and his team collect provides a solid foundation for the preservation of marine life by better understanding animal movement patterns, habitat preferences, and how the species are affected by anthropogenic impacts like fishing pressures, we can make much better informed management decisions in support of the conservation of imperiled marine life. So the work that Nick does is really important. He's published numerous scientific and popular magazine articles, has appeared on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, the National Geographic Channel, and his research has been supported by the NSF, the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Geographic Society, among others. His presentation tonight is entitled Robo Shark. Need I say more? How high tech tags are revealing the secret lives of sharks. But just before Nick comes to the podium, I would like to briefly introduce Dr. Jeff Carrier, who's in, this, in the audience with us, Professor Emeritus of Biology at Albion College. And as I said, we have some other Albion College alums here. Among many other achievements, Dr. Carrier was senior editor of the Signature Biology of Sharks and Their Relatives, volumes one and two. Some of you might know these volumes. And it also happens that Jeff was Nick's first academic supervisor. So I've asked Jeff to say a few words and then invite Nick to the podium. So thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. Any of you who are educators in the audience know how uh, proud we feel when we see some of our students uh, excel and go on to greatness, and Nick is an example of that. Uh, I first met him uh, almost 20 years ago when he was a, a high school student who was looking for a place to, to study sharks and, and chose Albion College. Uh, we worked together for almost 20 years, have published uh, together quite frequently. He's uh, written a couple of chapters in books that I've edited, and uh, uh, we're very excited for the work that he continues to do. We're especially excited to see our alums succeed. We have a number of them uh, from Albion who are joints. We, we're the biggest group in here. Uh, <laughs> some of these who are working at Harvard where they've uh, pioneered the development of things called letter cups and, and a variety of other devices that uh, uh, are useful for the kinds of work that Nick is going to describe to you tonight. We're especially pleased to see Nick come to the New England Aquarium, a very prestigious and highly respected captive facility, not just in the United States, but well beyond our borders, internationally renowned. So we're very proud to see that Nick has, has chosen a good institution to, to work for, and I think you'll look forward to hearing much more about uh, the groundbreaking work that he's been doing and continues to do. I'm very proud to introduce my former student and my continuing colleague, Dr. Nick Whitney. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, and, and thank you, Mark, as well. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here tonight on World Oceans Day and, and also the, uh, the one-year anniversary of the kickoff of the newly reorganized, restructured Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life here at New England Aquarium. So it's, it's a good night to be gathered here and, and talking about marine life and, and sharks specifically. Since I am I think maybe the newest scientist member of the Center for Ocean Life, or certainly one of the newest members, I thought I'd start out by giving you a little bit of background so you know where I, where I come from and, and uh, how I got started in sharks. Although Mark and Jeff both gave you a pretty good, pretty good idea. But I'm originally from uh, Jackson, Michigan, 
not quite as far away from the ocean as you can get, but pretty close. <laughs> and, uh, and, and growing up in Jackson, I knew basically one thing about sharks, and that's what I had seen in the movie Jaws, that, that sharks are the things that eat you when you try to go swimming in the ocean. Um, so when I was a kid and we would go on vacation to the ocean, either in the Carolinas or, or Florida, uh, this was me. I was building sand castles and, and playing in the shallows. Uh, never wanted to venture too far away from the shore. Uh, as I got older, I, I played a lot of beach paddle ball um, and, and did a lot of boardwalks, a lot of sightseeing, a lot of bird watching. Um, no, one, no one could have ever guessed that a kid with this kind of fashion sense would grow up to be a scientist. But, but it turns out that's what happened. So uh, after a few years, I started trying to figure out if there was a way to go in the ocean without being eaten by sharks. So I started trying to learn about them and, and read uh, scientific volumes like The Sharks of North American Waters by this guy, Jose Castro, who I would later end up uh, having an office right down the hall from him. I started uh, keeping aquariums in my room. I had a 55-gallon saltwater aquarium that I, I built the filter for with help from a science teacher in my high school. Um, and I also kept these uh, endangered African cichlids in my room that I would, I would breed them. They were mouth brooders. And so I, I had my bedroom was lined with walls of, of fish tanks growing up. So by the time uh, I was in high school and looking for a place to go to college, it was pretty clear that I was I was hooked on fish and marine biology, and, and I was kind of a shark nut. So I looked around at different schools. We actually made a trip out here to Boston, visited some of the schools out here, got a great behind-the-scenes tour of Woods Hole, even. And, uh, but I made, of course, the obvious choice, which was to go to Albion College, uh, <laughs> Albion, Michigan, just 30 minutes down the road from my house. Um, as, as you've already figured out, the reason Albion was such an obvious choice is because of this guy, Dr. Jeff Carrier who was doing work there on nurse sharks down in the Florida Keys every summer. And, uh, and as Jeff mentioned, I, I met him in one of my first visits to Albion when I was still a high school student. He took over an hour of his time to talk to me about his research and my interests. He had, he had just published an article in National Geographic magazine that was on the cover. And uh, after we met, he invited me. He said, hey, come to Albion and you can work with me on my shark research. And for me, it, would, it was like meeting Michael Jordan and having him invite you to come play for the Chicago Bulls or something. <laughs> or, or here for you locals, I guess it'd be like meeting Larry Bird and being invited to play for the, the 84 Celtics or something. I'm not going to make any Patriots analogies. <laughs> Working for New England Aquarium does not make me a Pats fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but so for three summers as an undergraduate, I got to work uh, with Jeff down in the Dry Tortugas, which is about 70 miles west of Key West in the Florida Keys. It's this isolated area that has a Civil War fort, and it's one of the few places in the world where you can observe uh, sharks mating in clear, shallow water on a predictable basis. So this is the work that, that Jeff and his colleagues have been doing for decades now, and most of what we know about shark mating behavior comes from this population of nurse sharks in the Keys. So I got to go down with Jeff and, and learn how to catch these sharks. We, we worked on the adult sharks. We worked on juveniles. Uh, neonates, we would catch them and tag them out of the back of kayaks. Um, and, and Jeff really introduced me to this whole world of shark research and, and put a shark in my hand for the first time. He also introduced me to this character, a guy named Wes Pratt, who uh, has been Jeff's partner in crime on this, on this study now for, for many years. And actually, if you've been down to the new Science of Sharks exhibit in the aquarium and you've seen the uh, photos and videos projected on the wall by photographer Brian Scarry, uh, one of the divers in, the, in that video is actually Wes. Um, and so he was, Wes was here last month and actually saw himself projected on the big screen there. It's it great to see Wes. He now is living in Maine and would love to be here tonight, but he is actually in the Keys right now preparing to sail this weekend to the Tortugas for his 25th consecutive year uh, studying nurse sharks in, in the Keys. He'll be, he's in his 70s, I won't give his exact age, um, but... Uh, He'll be paddling around and, and maybe catching a few nurse sharks and, and tagging them. So um, it was pretty amazing working with Jeff and, and Wes down in the Tortugas, and we were doing a number of different studies down there. Uh, but one of the ones I was most involved in was attaching tags to these nurse sharks, and specifically these acoustic transmitters, these acoustic pinger tags. And what these do is they're an electronic tag that emits a ping 
uh, underwater. You can't hear it with your own ears, but you can listen to it with an underwater microphone called a hydrophone. So my job as an undergraduate was to paddle a kayak around and dip this hydrophone in the water. You can see this uh, big pole on my kayak and a, a little black cup here, which is the actual hydrophone. So I would dip that under the water. And when I did, I could hear the sound of this, the tag pinging through a receiver that was on my boat. So uh, my job was to track nurse sharks and find out where they go, record their location on the GPS. And I would do this all day long, just nonstop paddling uh, for, for 10 hours a day. And as you can see, you get some pretty nice looking arms when you paddle in a kayak uh, for, for 10 or 12 hours a day. I thought that this was the greatest job in the world when I was doing it. I couldn't believe they let me, the undergraduate intern, be the one who gets to track the sharks. I, I thought they were crazy. Of course, once I got older, I realized that's exactly the job for an undergraduate intern, <laughs> is to have them paddle a kayak around all day. They actually think it's fun. So. Um, after getting this great experience at Albion College, working with Jeff, uh, I, I started looking at graduate schools. And I found another lab that was doing similar research with that kind of technology at, at the University of Hawaii. Uh, about a week before I moved to the University of Hawaii, uh, I got married. Uh, to, my, to my wife, Holly, I, I figured uh, a good scientist knows how to stretch a budget. And I figured, if I'm going to Hawaii, why not turn it into a honeymoon at the same time? So. My wife to this day says we never had a honeymoon. I say we had an eight-year Hawaiian honeymoon. Um, but, but starting to work in Hawaii, there was a lab out there who was studying this species, the tiger shark, using the exact same kind of technology. So this is what that same acoustic pinger tag looks like on a big tiger shark. So Hawaii is a great place to do shark research. There are plenty of sharks, uh, especially big tiger sharks. You can go offshore almost anywhere and catch sharks. Like this size, we roll them over onto their backs. They go into this sleep-like state called tonic immobility that allows you to do measurements and, and tag them. And you can even perform surgery if you need to. Uh, we would get in the water with them for pictures. Um, here's a couple of shots of, this is the largest tiger shark that's ever been physically measured. Uh, 15 feet, one inch. This is, this is the shark next to our 17-foot boat that we used to, to catch it and tag it. Um, so these were pretty fun times, and, and fortunately, after we do the tagging and release them, we'd get them in the water right next to them. They would always just swim off. They didn't want anything to do with us just to get on with their lives. But uh, the main species I worked on for my dissertation work, work was a white-tipped reef shark, which is basically the closest thing I could find to a nurse shark in, in Hawaii. These are, this is a species, a reef-oriented reef species that spends a lot of time resting on the bottom in caves or under ledges. And we did photo identification with the species. You can see they have a unique spot pattern on their side, like a fingerprint. Uh, we also did population genetics. But I also did this, this acoustic tracking again with these electronic pinger tags, <clears throat> this time surgically implanting them into a shark and tracking them from a slightly bigger boat than a kayak. Um, so after a few years of that, I, I finished up my master's and PhD at the University of Hawaii and uh, got a postdoc position at uh, Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. And this time when we made the move back across the Pacific and the country, uh, we, had, we had a couple more people in tow. Our boys here, uh, not sure how old they were at this age, maybe two and five, I think. Um, so moved to Moat Marine Lab and started getting into a different kind of technology, these things called accelerometers, who all of you are probably familiar with, whether you realize it or not. Um, an accelerometer is basically, today it's a, a sensor on a computer chip, and it's found in almost all modern electronics from digital cameras uh, to your smartphones. When you're looking at an image on your phone and you rotate your phone and the image rotates, so you're still looking at it right side up, that's because the accelerometer inside is detecting acceleration from the Earth's gravity, so it knows which way is up and which way is down. For those of you who have played video games like the Nintendo Wii, it's an accelerometer in the controller that, that allows the movement from your hand to be transferred to the screen. And of course, a lot of you are probably wearing Fitbits, which use an accelerometer, again, to count your footsteps and, and how, much, uh, how many calories, estimate how many calories you're burning throughout the day. So uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the first scientists to get my hands on one of these devices that was put into a, a tag to use on wild animals. And they told me to just test it on whatever wild animal I had access to. And I 
had these two kids here. So, so we tagged the kids, and I always used to show this video. They're actually wearing tags on their foot. Um, but I've, we've updated it because there are now more of them, basically. We, we, now have, we now have three kids. So this is the new version of this demonstration experiment. We put tags on, on the shoes of all three of my children. And uh, if I zoom in here, these are the exact same tags that we use on the sharks. Um, so they all have these shoes, these tags cable tied to their feet. And what I want you to do is, in a second here, I'm going to show you some data uh, from these tags, but only, just only focus on this one in the middle, the seven-year-old Nigel. Um, the two-year-old isn't quite old enough to take instructions well, and the uh, ten-year-old is too cool for school, so he didn't, he didn't listen well and didn't really produce the best data. So. <laughs> I'll play this video for you, but, but focus, on, focus on the one in the middle if you can. So right now, uh, Nigel's mostly holding still, and you get this flat line in the data. Now he's, he's taking small steps here. That's when you start to get these spikes, when, he takes, when he's moving in just small little steps. Then he's going to freeze in a second here. At least the foot with the tag will freeze, so you get this flat line. He's got an itch, but he's keeping his foot still. So now, in a second here, he's going to start taking bigger steps. There he goes, which produces bigger spikes. There's more force behind each <laughs> step. And they're, they're dabbing. So now he's holding still, and you get this flat line again. And in a second, you can see something really exciting is going to happen. You get these big spikes. <laughs> and he's dancing and really putting a lot of force behind each, each step. And he falls down. You lose the signal a little bit when he falls down. But uh, this just gives you an idea of the kind of data we get from these, uh, from these accelerometers. A lot of times people hear accelerometer and they think we're measuring uh, speed, how fast something is moving. We're actually, acceleration is a change in velocity. So we get a spike every time there's a footstep, or in the case of sharks, a, a tail beat. So one of our first experiments with, with uh, a shark was just to attach it to uh, the outside of the fin like we would normally do our pinger tags and just get, look at the data that we get when the animal is swimming versus resting. So you get flat lines when the animal is resting and, and spikes when it's swimming. This seems pretty basic, but this is actually a huge step forward for the technology and the research because when I was tracking uh, white tip reef sharks using those acoustic pinger tags, I could sit for hours in one spot uh, tracking from a boat and I had no idea if my shark that I was tracking was just sitting under a ledge uh, resting like this, or it could have also just as easily been engaged in some huge feeding frenzy moving around like crazy, but just not moving far enough away on the reef to warrant me to move my boat to track it. So, um, so an accelerometer, even just getting active versus resting is a huge step forward. So that was our, that was our first foray into this, but once I got to moat, obviously the first thing I wanted to do is get down to my old stomping grounds in the Florida Keys and the Dry Tortugas and see if we could record some more interesting behavior uh, than just moving or resting with these accelerometers. And I knew that there was some interesting behavior going on in the Dry Tortugas. Uh, as I mentioned, this is, this is a great place to observe shark mating behavior. Uh, the females actually come into shallow water every year to, to seek refuge from the males who are a little more aggressive and a little more eager to mate. Um, and mating involves a lot of interesting movements and positions that are very easy to pick up on an accelerometer and very different from what the sharks are engaged in in our normal day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so shark mating involves, typically involves a male shark grasping the fin of a female shark. They have internal fertilization. So male sharks have re paired reproductive organs called claspers, and the male shark has to insert one of those claspers into the female cloaca in order to fertilize her eggs. So for those of you familiar with mammalian reproduction, this will sound familiar. Uh, choosing my words carefully for the, for the younger audience members. But uh, we're going to show you a, a short video clip of what this looks like in the shallow water. Here you have a male shark grasping the female's fin. We don't say biting because they're not actually biting down as hard as they could. They seem to be controlling their, their bite to some extent. And here's a male attached to a female, and this is what we call a successful copulation. He has one clasper inserted into the female, and you'll see that. This, this video was by Wes Pratt. You get a very close look. Wes, Wes loves making videos like this. Um, <laughs> 
So you'll see in a second, you can see they're, they're going belly up. You've seen head down postures. These are all things that can show up very well uh, on the accelerometer record, as I'll show you in a second. So these are the tags that, that I put on my kids' feet and also the ones we used on the sharks. Now the problem is these tags record so much data. They record about 100 data points every second in order to get really fine, ta fine scale aspects of the shark's tail beats and changes in pitch and posture. They also record depth and temperature. So that's too much data to transmit back to us. So we have to actually get these tags back from the sharks. They store the data to memory and we have to recover the tags to get those data. So to do that, uh, we had to invent a way to, uh, to get the tags back. So we designed and built these custom made floats that we attached to the shark's fin and we attached them with a little, uh, a little last here that starts corroding as soon as it hits seawater and eventually releases this whole strap that allows the tag to float up away from the shark and, uh, and come to the surface where we can recover it using this, which is a, a VHF radio transmitter. Basically the same thing as our underwater pinger except this one transmits through the air. Um, so that's the, that's the method we used. Here's a slightly closer look at that, and this is the corrosive link that will eventually release and allow the tag to come off the fin. So this is what a nurse shark looks like swimming around in the shallows with one of our tags on, and this is another reason this is such a great research site is we can get in the water and take photos and video so that we can validate what the sharks are actually doing with the data that we see from the accelerometers. And when we do that, we get this really nice data uh, this is swimming behavior. Each one of these spikes represents a tail beat by the shark. When they're resting on the bottom, again, you get mostly a flat line. And you can see when something interesting happens. For instance, here's a shark that's swimming around and then was disturbed and then swims away at a faster speed. You can see the, the tail beats are closer together, meaning it's beating its tail faster, and they also have more amplitude. There's a little more force behind each tail beat. And again, I know that this shark was disturbed when this happened because I was the one who disturbed it. It turned out I was swimming around with a little underwater hydrophone here trying to find our shark in somewhat murky water and uh, we almost ran into each other. So if, if I had been wearing an accelerometer, my, my trace would have looked very similar to the shark's trace. Um, but then of course, we're also able to see some of this mating behavior happening in really shallow water. And it turns out, Mating behavior produces a really unique acceleration signature. And I'm just showing you the raw data here from three axes of acceleration. And all you really need to see is that it looks really messy. Uh, this, is, this is normal swimming up here on this side. This is somewhat faster swimming as this, I think this is from a female who was leaving the mating event quickly. But all of this stuff represents just rolling and going upside down and, and the actual mating event. We can take this raw data and filter it so we have what's called static acceleration, which basically gives us the animal's body orientation, so we can see when they go head down or roll from side to side. This is the same thing that your iPhone's using when it rotates the image, it's static acceleration from Earth's gravity. And then we can also look at dynamic acceleration, which is acceleration from the animal's body movements. So here you get a nice clean signal when it's just swimming normally. During the mating, it's kind of all over the place. Sometimes it's not producing a regular tail beat at all. And then when it's swimming away after the event, uh, you're getting a, a nice strong signal there too because it's doing very rhythmic tail beats going back and forth. Uh, that's the same dynamic acceleration as what your Fitbit's recording when it counts your, counts your steps. So if we look at some of these larger data sets, you can see it's not hard to see when a mating event took place. Uh, you have all now just received enough training to identify mating behavior from these acceleration traces. You can see some animals mate uh, only a few times a day, some animals mate several times a day. It varies not only on the animal, but also what, also the time of the mating season. Uh, certain females will mate uh, quite a bit for several days and then not mate for several days. Uh, we think it may have something to do with the female's ovulation cycle. We, we're not sure. Uh, we can also tell what time of day mating events are, are happening. Uh, you can see actually most mating events, at least for our first few animals, were taking place during the day. Um, we can also tell how long a typical mating event lasts. So, you can see the vast majority of mating events are actually last two minutes or less. A lot of these are probably failed events where the male approaches the female, grasps the fin, and she shakes him off. Uh, it, even though these mating events look violent for the female because she's being bitten by the male, we think the females are actually very much in control. They seem to be able to avoid mating with anyone they don't want to, and they select certain males that they then cooperate with. 
But you can see some of these longer events get up to six, eight, ten minutes. We even had one mating event that lasted over 20 minutes, which some people are more impressed by than others. <laughs> but um, just look around the room at this point and see who's, who's really shocked by that. So um, anyway, let's talk about some surprises that we see from this data. So for starters, uh, this is just a death trace from a nurse shark. And this is exactly what I expected to see when we started putting these tags on nurse sharks, that they would just stay in very shallow water, very little movement whatsoever. This is probably from one of our females that's resting in the shallows a lot. Uh, one of the first tags I got back was off of a male nurse shark, and it looked like this. Uh, this looks like the kind of data you'd expect from a tuna or a marlin or something like that. Repeatedly going from the surface down to the bottom. This is, you know, a, a hundred feet deep. And uh, when I first saw this data, I assumed the tag had failed. These were kind of experimental tags. I said, this, this data is garbage. I, I emailed the company. I said, sorry, your tag malfunctioned. Um, and I was really bummed out. But when they actually, when they looked, they looked harder at the data than I did because they didn't know that it was from a nurse shark. And they said, you know, if you zoom in and look at, this, look at these data and compare it to the acceleration data, it, it looks real. Like when the animal's going up in the water column, the pitch of the animal is pointed up and pointed down when the animal's going down. And they said, are you sure that this isn't legitimate data? And it, I looked and sure enough, it was. It turns out when nurse sharks are traveling, especially the males going from one, potentially one mating site to another, they repeatedly go up and down in the water column, just like, just like tunas and other fish. Uh, here's another surprise. This is, this is, you see this characteristic messy signature that looks like a mating event. Uh, if you look at the depth trace, you can see an animal that was basically swimming along on the bottom and then suddenly shot up to the surface. This is about 75 feet deep here and then shot up almost to the surface and then came down much more slowly than it went up. And the mating event starts somewhere up here near the surface and then proceeds as they go down to the bottom and lasts for several minutes on the bottom before it ends and the animal swims away. Uh, this was a fascinating thing to see because we hadn't been able to observe mating in deep water uh, before this. Uh, but when I saw this trace, I knew exactly what I was looking at because I had seen this before in a study I had done on white-tipped reef sharks in Hawaii uh, with Jeff and Wes as well, where we analyzed this video of mating white-tipped reef sharks. And a lot of times, this is what shark mating behavior looks like. It starts off. In shallow water or near the surface, you have a male, or sometimes multiple males, as in this case, trying to mate with a female. And you can see they just they spiral down to the bottom slowly and eventually end up down on the bottom where the mating event is either successful or not from the male's perspective. Um, and so this is basically what you saw. I think in this case, neither male ends up successfully mating. But uh, this, is what you're, this is exactly what you're seeing in this trace here. You have a, a nurse shark shooting up to the surface and presumably grasping a female's pectoral fin or engaging a female. And then from this data, you can see they're spiraling around, going up and down as they sink down to the bottom where that event continues for several minutes. So that was a pretty exciting discovery uh, to find from our tags. We're now trying to use the same tags to see if we can detect mating in other species that we've, where we've never seen it before. So just last week, I was down in South Carolina where around this time of year, they catch black tip sharks uh, that, where the females will have these mating, fresh mating wounds on their fins and on their sides. And uh, so I'm anxious to see what those, what those data look like when we, when we download and look at those. Um, after this, this sort of mating study, getting into that, um, I wanted to see if there was a way we could also use these tags to look at energy expenditure in sharks and see maybe if there was some way we could tie that to climate change and, and warming sea temperatures. So we're actually able to get a grant from the National Science Foundation to study sharks in a respirometer. Uh, it's basically a treadmill for sharks. Uh, they, they stay in, they sw we put them in a box and there's a circular movement of water so they can swim while they're in one place. Sometimes we'll use a static respirometer, which is basically just a holding tank that has a plastic lid over it. And the idea is that it's sealed off, so any oxygen that the shark is consuming in the water uh, will be able to detect it as it uses that oxygen. We've got an oxygen probe in the tank with them. Uh, here you can see what it looks like from inside the static respirometer. You've got the plastic lid on top, and the shark swims around in a circle. 
And we do this while they wear an accelerometer on their fin so that we can correlate their swimming movements with the amount of oxygen they consume. So it turns out, fortunately, uh, that we get a really nice relationship between uh, acceleration and the amount of oxygen they consume. And you can see we've got two lines here for two different temperatures. So that relationship actually changes depending on the temperature of the water. They use more, uh, they use more energy at higher temperatures. Um, and also the relationship between their energy use and their tail beats changes at the higher temperatures. So we get a nice, this is like an R squared of 0.91 uh, for you, for you data nerds. I met a couple of you before the talk who were interested in, in the data side. So um, the whole idea, the reason we do this is that if we can do these captive experiments and figure out the relationship between oxygen consumption and acceleration, we can then take our tags and put them on sharks in the wild and figure out how much oxygen they're consuming in the wild based on their acceleration tag data. So if you can figure out how much oxygen an animal is consuming, you can estimate how many calories they're burning, you can get an idea of how much food they need to eat to replace those calories, and you can get an idea of what their impact is on their environment. So this is all to get something we call field metabolic rate, which is kind of the holy grail of of marine behavioral ecology. People have been trying to get this for decades in a variety of species using a number of methods. But this is, what's, this is what uh, your Fitbit is doing. It's estimating your energy expenditure based on your footsteps. And the way it does that is because somebody had to do this background research in a lab first, um, probably not on a, in a tank, but on a treadmill with some person with a mask that was recording their oxygen consumption. So uh, we also started doing, using these tags on some other species, uh, sturgeon, sea turtles, a little bit of work with spotted eagle rays, also these Burmese pythons, which are an invasive species that are just destroying the Everglades. Um, I'm not going to talk about that stuff tonight. I'm going to stick with the sharks. But uh, most of the work we've been doing in the past few years has been using these tags to look at post-release mortality in sharks. And what that means is when a shark is caught by a fisherman and released, uh, we like to think that they all swim off and live long, happy lives and make baby sharks, but that's not always the case. And, and it's an important thing to know because when either recreational or commercial fishermen, uh, when, a, when a shark population uh, starts to lose their numbers and is in trouble, managers will normally institute a rule that says, okay, you're no longer allowed to kill this species of shark. If you catch it, you have to turn it loose. Um, but it's important to know if that's actually working. Are those animals surviving after they're being released? So we've been working with both uh, recreational fishermen and, uh, and commercial longline fishermen to find out how well those sharks do. I'm going to show you now just a brief video to give you an idea of, of how this works. Of sharks that are caught and released by fishermen, how many of them actually survive? To do that, we're using these acceleration data loggers. They're accelerometer tags that record every tail beat the shark makes. These data loggers combine the depth, the pitch and tail beats so that Nick and his team can tell when the sharks are swimming down, swimming up, if they live or if they die. A technique that's never been used to study the sharks off this coast. So here's the process. They first catch the sharks and then on them put an accelerometer and float package. So when we roll them over like this, they go into a sleep-like state called tonic immobility. Ideally, they just totally zonk out and hold still throughout the tagging process when they're like this. Off, huh? It doesn't always work. This thing starts corroding in seawater as soon as it gets wet, and eventually it allows the whole strap to come off, and the tag releases from the shark's fin and floats up to the surface. And once it hits the surface, this radio transmitter starts sending out a signal that we can hear from up to about 10 miles away. It's even more fun when, when we put these tags out and then we have to go out and look for them and get them back. After 24 to 48 hours, the team now has to recover a whole bunch of floating tags, each one sending out a small There we go. So when we get the data back from these uh, sharks caught and released by fishermen, our, our, the first study we did this on was uh, black tip sharks caught in the recreational fishery in Florida. We look at their depth first, and you see a lot of this repetitive diving from the, the surface down to what we assume is the bottom. If we look at their tail beat data, the acceleration data, we can zoom in and see that this shark is swimming along just fine. These sharks are what we call obligate ram ventilators. It means they have to keep swimming in order to pass water into their mouth and out over their gills. Uh, so this, this is a shark that survived. Uh, sometimes it doesn't look like that. Sometimes you start out with 
depth data that are going up and down, and then it kind of flat lines here and bottoms out. And then uh, when we look at the tail beat data, we can zoom in on this and see it starts off normally, but eventually you end up with a flat line and then a couple of tail beats here as the animal's trying to recover. It'll, it'll normally be several minutes to an hour that they're trying to keep swimming and get up off the bottom, but eventually everything goes flat and that's how you know you have a dead shark. So it turns out these tags are a really good way to identify how many sharks are dying after they're caught by fishermen and also much cheaper than using satellite tags, which is kind of the traditional method. So from this study, we found that uh, post-release mortality in this fishery was less than 10%. So over 90% of the sharks caught by fishermen in this fishery are surviving. That's great news for this fishery. This is only for the Florida recreational fishery and only for animals that were kept in the water. Uh, so that's great news for the recreational fishermen, but what about for our, our commercial fishermen? That's a little bit different. These sharks are caught by long line. They're typically on the hook for much longer and uh, have a much rougher process. And as you would expect, we're doing this for several species, your rates of post-release mortality, so this is the percentage of sharks that actually die, uh, is much higher for several of these species. Some of them are really tough. If you look at, for instance, uh, sandbar, tiger, and bull sharks, they have very low mortality rates. They almost always survive. Whereas uh, some of these other species, like black tip sharks, spinners, great hammerheads have much higher post-release mortality. So if you're just releasing all these sharks and assuming that they were swimming off and doing fine, you'd be very mistaken, and that has serious management implications. Uh, all of this work has been funded by, by NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, let's talk about surprises again for a second. One of the things I love about this research is that almost every time we start a new study, we find surprising things that we weren't expecting. Um, so in the video I just showed with a little graphic, he showed the shark after when it died flipped upside down. Turns out sharks almost always die right side up. They don't flip up. They don't flip over and die like a cartoon. Um, they're almost always stay perfectly right side up and die on the bottom. But when they do die, um, often we find that they're eaten by other sharks very quickly. So here's an example of a shark that was, that was caught swimming normally in the beginning here, but then these flat lines you see indicate that this shark died on the bottom. Here, let me zoom in on that a bit for you. Uh, flat line in depth, flat line in tail beats, flat line in pitch. Uh, this is a dead black tip shark. This is an X shark. So uh, if then what happens later after this dotted line is all of a sudden we go from flat lines to now all of a sudden we're getting depth data again. You see this big, some big commotion here happened. Uh, we're now getting tail beats again. And what you're looking at here, let me back it up and, and so you can see the whole data set. What you're looking at here is an animal that had died, and then right here at this dotted line was eaten by another shark, probably a larger shark. And we can also tell that that's the case, that this isn't the case of a shark just waking up and being alive again, because when the shark was first swimming, we have uh, tail beats that look like this, about 0.7 hertz, which means almost one tail beat every second, a little bit slower than that. When the shark died, we had a flat line, of course, as you'd expect. And then later, for the whole rest of the track, we have tail beats at 0.5 hertz, or about uh, one tail beat every two seconds. So a much slower tail beat. Bigger sharks are going to have slower tail beats. So we get a very different signature there. That's how we know we, we're, we're now studying a completely different animal than the one that we tagged. So we started out with a tag on our black tip. It died, and then we end up studying the tag in the stomach of this, this bigger shark. Uh, so that's always interesting. Now, unfortunately, sharks, tags that are inside the stomach of sharks are very hard for us to recover um, when, we're, when we're driving around the surface listening for the signal. So sometimes we don't find these tags. Um, our overall tag recovery rate is actually about 94%, which is, still shocks me. Um, but when they get eaten, it's much lower. So here's, here's an example of a tag, for instance. We do usually get them back eventually. But here's a tag I just got back uh, two weeks ago that was actually recovered off of South Padre Island in Texas. This was a, a great hammerhead shark that we tagged off of Tampa. And it died after a few hours and was eaten. And the tag was in the stomach of a, another shark for about nine days before it was regurgitated and floated up to the surface. And then for about a year, almost exactly a year, drifted across the Gulf to South Padre Island. I've drawn this as a straight line here only because I don't know the drift path. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a straight line. 
but, uh, but this is what the tag looked like when we got it back, and we were able to send the tag back to the manufacturer, and they were able to get the data, which is how I was able to tell you that story that I just told you, because we could see what happened. Uh, I just wanted to also briefly mention a study that we've done a little bit of work with here, here locally, starting in about 2012, with this species uh, that most of you probably recognize as a white shark. And this researcher that most of you probably recognize is Dr. Greg Skolmel, who spoke here uh, two weeks ago. I was working with Dr. Skolmel and uh, the nonprofit research group OSEARCH. They're the ones who bring these, they have the ship that brings the sharks out of the water in a hydraulic lift. Uh, this is a picture of Mary Lee, who some of you may have heard of. She's probably the most famous shark in the world at this point with like 100,000 Twitter followers or something like that. Um, we were able to put an accelerometer on Mary Lee and get some data from her for, for at least a, about a day and a half. Um, this was tagging Catherine. For those of you who keep track of these famous sharks, Mary Lee and Catherine are a couple of the, the big ones. Uh, this was Lydia that we tagged off the coast of Jacksonville. So the, my tag here, the accelerometer tag, is this orange one here, and this is a slightly larger version uh, that we use for white sharks. And then this is a satellite tag, which the sharks also get. These are the tags that actually show you where the sharks go and produce the, the cool maps that you may have seen on the internet, or there's also a, a phone app where you can track these sharks. Um, but just to give you a brief look at the acceleration data, our sample size is pretty small. We've only tagged a few of these animals. Uh, so this is not published, but uh, several of them do this, this yo-yo diving behavior or swing glide behavior where they're going again from the surface down to the bottom repeatedly. And I'm, I've got this illustration here to give you an idea of the animal's body pitch when it's going down and piling up. Uh, the interesting thing is when you look at the tail beats, when they're on their way down, they basically stop swimming and just glide all the way down. And when they turn to go up to the surface, they, start, they have to swim pretty hard to, to make the turn and start going back up. That's because sharks are negatively buoyant. If a shark stops swimming, it will sink. Unlike bony fish that typically have a swim bladder that they can use to control their buoyancy. Um, so we think this method of swimming is probably an energy conservation strategy. If you think about being an animal that has to swim every second from the moment you're born to the moment you die, it makes sense to find ways to get a rest uh, periodically. Um, they also may be, they, this also may be a foraging strategy. When they're doing these dives in deep water, it's also possible that they're sleeping on the glide phase of the dive. We know all vertebrates sleep. We don't know how or why they sleep, and uh, very little is known about sleeping in, in sharks. So um, again, this satellite tag here is the one that, that produces some of these really cool maps that shows you where these sharks are going. And uh, one of the things we've seen is that these sharks we tagged off Cape Cod uh, hang out on a lot of those beaches where I, used to, where I used to go as a kid in the Carolinas and the east coast of Florida. So it makes me feel a little, you know, not so bad about always staying uh, on the shoreline. Um, but for, for a kid who grew up terrified of Jaws, it was pretty cool to be able to, to tag some of these big white sharks. Um, so, after, after being at Moat Marine Lab for a while, we had these, we had these two boys, and, uh, and we were done having kids, but we, we failed to yield the lesson uh, from Jurassic Park that, <laughs> that you're, you're not always done when you think you're done. And uh, we found out a few years ago we were having a third, and uh, if you think the people sticking with that theme, if you think they were scared at Jurassic Park when they heard the footsteps coming, uh, boy, you should have seen me when we found out we were having a third. But um, this, is, this is our little, our little velociraptor here, uh, Margo, who, who came along. And, and once we had three kids, we decided it was time. We needed to get closer to home. We'd been uh, far away from family for, for long enough, and we needed to get back uh, where we had maybe a little more help. Uh, so, so, so we moved back to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, where my sister lived with her husband and their three kids. We're breeders, we Whitney's men. We, we know how to make some kids. But um, when, I was, when I was working in Cincinnati, Ohio, I was still working for Mo Marine Laboratory, but it occurred to me that if I could work for a marine lab in Florida from Cincinnati, Ohio, I could work for a marine lab just about anywhere from Cincinnati, Ohio. So um, I, I came into contact with uh, John Mandelman here and started talking to him about coming to the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. 
seemed like a great opportunity. In, in John, I saw someone who uh, I thought we, we saw a lot of, had a lot in common. Um, we see eye to eye on a lot of things, including fashion. Um, he, he also has a work ethic that is, that is in line with mine. Um, just, just sort of general laziness, which I know he's, he's spread that to some other members of his team. Um, so, but no, in all, in all seriousness, I'm making fun of John because he wasn't able to be here tonight. And, uh, and because I was going to make fun of him even if he was here. But uh, in all seriousness, I'm thrilled to be here at the Anderson Cabin Center for Ocean Life. And uh, it's, it's a great setup. I'm able to, in, in Cincinnati now, I have... Uh, my own lab where I'm able to uh, keep developing new tags here and we're now we're now 3d printing our tags so that we can design new models and fail faster um, <laughs> but here's a here's a 3d printed shark fin with a 3d printed model of our of our tag so we can easily and quickly develop new prototypes uh, you can see one of these guys here this is my assistant Owen uh, this guy made the 3D printer and uh, he kind of jumped in the photo at the last second, photo bombed us basically. Um, so anyway, I'm still able to travel for, for field work either in Florida or the Carolinas and, and hopefully we're getting some projects started locally here soon. And also in, in Cincinnati when I need, in the occasions when I need access to uh, live animals to test tags or something, uh, we're also working with Newport Aquarium which is in Newport, Kentucky just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati, and they've never been engaged in research before, so it's a great, great thing to, to loop them into research as well. Um, I'm going to get to your questions in a second, but before I do, I wanted to give just one more little spiel about uh, sort of the, the scientific process in general. As you can see, most of the research I'm talking about is, is pretty fun stuff, to be honest, and uh, at, at at best, we're doing things that is really important for understanding climate change or understanding fisheries impacts on sharks. At worst, we're studying things that are just really interesting uh, but may not have a lot of application. I'm, I'm not curing cancer, I'll be honest with you. Um, but especially in recent times, I've, I've realized that just the field of science in general has started to feel a little bit more of a noble endeavor even when you're, even when you're doing stuff like this. So I wanted to explain a little bit um, you've seen on, throughout the talk, you may have noticed uh, some of these little things coming up at the bottom of the screen that normally have my name or someone else's name and a date. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, these are referring to uh, peer-reviewed scientific papers. And what that means is that here's an example of a paper we published where we actually got uh, the cover of this journal, which is why I always use it as an example <laughs> of a scientific paper. But um, a lot of you here may be familiar with this, but some of you may not be, so I, I thought I'd share it. Some people tend to think that when we publish a paper, it's just me who I have this data and I write it up and I'm excited about it and I send it to the journal and they publish it, like we're writing letters to the editor or something. In fact, that's not how it works at all. What happens is we have a process called the peer review process, where basically I write up a paper and try and make it absolutely perfect and which can take months or years of data collection and analysis. And I send it to the journal, and the editor then takes that manuscript, and he sends it out to reviewers. And it's usually somewhere between two and four reviewers. And, and these people are anonymous. That's why they're just silhouette mugshots up there. <laughs> they're anonymous. I don't know who they are, but I know they're not my friends. They, they don't, they're, I'm not allowed, not allowed to have my papers sent to Jeff Carrier, for instance, to review. Um, and give me a favorable review. A lot of cases, these are people who are competing with me for grant money or um, trying to publish papers that, you know, trying to do similar work in the field. And they have every incentive in the world to find the flaws in my manuscript. And they do. They find a lot of flaws. And what happens is they write up all the mistakes that they see or all the problems they see with it, and they send them back to me in the form of reviews. I will then, with my co-authors, go through those reviews and try and line by line with each one, either make a change to accommodate their review or defend what we've done and argue back and say, no, you're wrong and here's why. And we send these back as responses to the reviewer's comments. A lot of times at that point, the reviewers then get to read what I said to them and make another judgment and decide what they think and give that to the editor. And eventually the editor of the journal makes a final decision on, on whether the paper gets published. 
This whole process could easily take six months to a year, and sometimes longer. And at the end of that, you can find out your paper is rejected. So you just spent one year arguing with people, and you have absolutely nothing to show for it whatsoever. It's, it's not uncommon at all. So, um, and, and that process happens every time we submit a, a paper for peer review publication. So um, this may be the first, look at that, you can actually read my CV. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna read you all the papers in my CV. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but just to give you an example, every single paper on that CV went through this process. So, and, and, that's, how, and that's how science works in general. So I, I tell you this just, I ask you to think about this the next time you're watching uh, some cable news pundit talk about, you know, climate change is a hoax, or that you shouldn't vaccinate your kids, or, you know, we can, we can go down the list. But when you see these things, or you see these stories on Facebook, I just ask that you, you ask yourself, is the person who's telling me this, have they committed themselves to a process of peer review like this? Or have they, do you think they've tried to find the flaws in their argument at all? or put their argument in front of anybody else to find those flaws. Um, this process isn't perfect. In science, mistakes get published in scientific papers all the time. But every time it happens, the reason we find out it happens is because some other scientist came through and tried to replicate that experiment or did another experiment and showed that it was false. So um, even when we're just doing this, even when we're just doing the fun stuff, uh, scientists in general as a field have committed themselves to this process of self-examination, trying to overcome your own cognitive biases and, and find the truth. And I think that's a pretty important thing, um, especially, especially now more than ever. So uh, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Yes. Words about what the mechanism is when you turn the shark upside down that goes mm. to that uh, relaxed sleep state. Sure, so, so he's, he's asking, asking about the mechanism that allows the sharks to go into a sleep like state when we turn them upside down. It's called tonic immobility. Um, we don't really understand why it happens or how it happens. Uh, it's, it seems to be, it seems to hold for uh, every shark that we've tried it on so far and, and rays and even other. Even non-elasma pranks, I think there are some reptiles that do it, and probably others, Mark can probably tell you. Um, it's incredibly convenient, uh, especially when you're, when you're trying to take measurements on a shark or tag. You saw a lot, in a lot of cases, we'll actually surgically implant tags, and most of the time the sharks will lie there perfectly still while we do that surgical implantation and sew them up and everything, and swim off totally fine. Um, but it's not, it's not a well understood phenomenon by any means. And as you saw in the video, they will occasionally snap out of it. Uh, the, the tiger sharks in Hawaii were notorious for staying in that state through an entire surgery. And then especially with the males, we go to measure the claspers and they wake up. Um, we, we would always do the clasper measurements last. <laughs> Strange, I know, it's funny, but true. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's tonic immobility. Questions? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> let, let me, I'll try and, I'll try and paraphrase your question. You're, you're basically asking, they've asked me to repeat the question so everyone can hear. Um, you're asking about the effect of warming seawater temperatures and what that's going to do to shark metabolic rate as you were talking about warmer water having less oxygen and sharks needing to expend more energy. Uh, yes, all of that, all of that is going to be an issue. Um, the fact that sharks Sharks are, are ectothermic for the most part, and they, their body temperature is gonna go up and down with water temperature. And they're also, it's, it's a well-known fact that animals will expend more, ectothermic animals will expend more energy at warmer temperatures. Um, but what wasn't known until our study, at least for these species, is that 
uh, that relationship, that really nice relationship between tailfeed activity and oxy oxygen consumption, the nature of that relationship also changes at the warmer temperatures. Um, but yeah, we're already seeing the, the effects of this with certain species changing their species distribution, their range. You have a couple of different things. You have one being um, the amount of energy they use at a given temperature, but also there's also thermal tolerance. How much can they, how warm of a temperature can they actually handle and what temperature do they operate best at? So sharks will tend to find the temperature that they prefer where they operate best or where, where their prey are operating best. And so as water conditions and sea, sea temperatures change, they will, they'll change their distribution as well as their energy expenditure. Other questions? Yes. Good question. So, so it's, can we discern other behaviors beside ma besides mating? One of the reasons I like mating is because it's so clear and easy to distinguish. Um, you can distinguish feeding in some species, and it depends on how unique the feeding behavior is. So we've, we've published a little example of feeding in spotted eagle rays where they, spotted eagle rays will excavate things on the bottom and they'll, a lot of times they'll flap their wings really vigorously to stir up the sand and excavate uh, animals on the bottom. That's really easy to see from, from the acceleration data. You can't necessarily tell if they were successful, if they were actually able to eat the things that they excavated, but you can at least tell that they're engaged in foraging activity. Um, as far as like a black tip shark or something that's swimming constantly, uh, we can record little bursts of activity where maybe they were pursuing something, um, but not definitively enough where they could, we could say, okay, yes, they're feeding right now. Um, also, it depends on the size of the animal. For small sharks, if you see a burst of activity, they may be trying to get away from something. Um, so I, I think it's very context dependent, and you would have to do a lot of ground truthing to validate what you were seeing. Um, so basically, the more, the more unique the, the movement is for the behavior, the more likelihood you have of being able to clearly say that's what it is from acceleration data. Good question. Yes? Um, with your data for catch and release, you said that some sharks have more morality of um, like recreational sharks um, when they get released. Uh, can you tell like when they die, like, how that person was holding the shark, say they just picked it up vertically mm. instead of horizontally and broke its mm. jaw and it died that way? Or like, do you ever write down like when you catch the shark, um, how it was captured and how it was brought in because everybody can catch a shark differently. Right. Um, and that goes for more commercial where you said more, and more, um, more sharks died from being online for a longer period of time. Like, right. I'm curious to see if you can bring that to Fish and Wildlife saying that they have to check their lines more right. to, you know, protect sharks' well-being. Say that shark, if it's on a line for 30 minutes, it's considered for an hour or two, where if it's just on a, sh on a line for 30 minutes, it will survive. But if it's on a line for two hours, it's going to die. It has more of a chance of dying. Right. Um, I mean, uh, Recreational fishing, I think more people, it's like how they pick up if a fish or if a shark, if they pick it up and they just hold it straight up because that's not how a fish is on water. It doesn't just go straight up. It's sure. more, you know, horizontal. Right. So, so the question is about the effects of different handling methods by fishermen and, and different times of soaking your gear, for instance, and what, the, what effect that has on the shark's uh, survivorship. And uh, to answer your question, we do measure that. So in our study with recreational fishermen, we know exactly how the fish was handled and we recorded all that because we're always on the boat when we put the tags on. Um, so, and, and we're, because we're just by putting the tags on, we also draw blood and look at their blood stress values. So we're actually doing more to the shark than what most fishermen would normally do if the fisherman was gonna keep it in the water. We do at least keep it in the water. And that's why I had the caveat in there for the recreational study that that very low mortality rate was, we could only say that that was true for animals that were kept in the water. In some cases, they are brought out of the water, either for pictures or for other things. Yeah, and, and we, can't, we can't say. We just, in our fishery, we talked to several different captains and who said that they left the shark in the water, so we tried to do, and, and we went out with actual recreational charter captains and tried to treat the animal exactly the way they would normally treat it 
with the exception of attaching the tags and, and taking blood. Uh, for the commercial longline fishermen, absolutely the amount of time that they have the gear in the water has an effect. So each, each hook, we will put on a hook timer so we know exactly when the shark, say the, the line is soaking for four hours, we have a timer on each hook so we know uh, if that shark has been on the line for three and a half hours or whether it just took the bait right before we pulled it in, like 20 minutes ago or something. So, and you do see a correlation. The longer that, the longer that fish has been on the line, the more likely it is that it will die uh, after it's released. So you're right that that would probably be, especially since commercial fishermen often can't control what species of shark they catch. So if you had a population that was really in trouble and wanted to protect it, and it had a high post-release mortality, you'd probably have to institute a rule that limited soak times, you know, and say, okay, we know, we know that if an animal's on the line for two hours that they have a mortality of over, post-release mortality over 50%. So then you would limit the soak time to, you know, less than two hours or something like that. In regulations for commercial fishermen, or you know, if we had a problem with um, codfish right. here in Massachusetts, like was anything, out, out of your knowledge, like have, does that ever get implemented, you know, for commercial fishermen, or? I would say for our for our commercial longliners, I'd say it could be implemented. Most of the stuff from the commercial longliner you've longline work you've seen here is still unpublished, um, but. Most of the ways I've seen it implemented has been in species closure. So sandbar sharks, for instance, in the southeast, their populations have been found to be overfished. And so they've been a prohibited species now for several years. You just can't keep them. Um, but fortunately, we're finding that their post-release mortality is actually really low. So that's probably an effective management strategy for them. They can be on the line for a long time. Um, I'm not that familiar with what's been done regionally here, um, but we can we can get Dr. Kneebone or someone down here to answer that <laughs> in, in a second. Yeah. Yes. Good question. So how long how long can we take to tag them considering they have to keep moving in order to survive? First of all, not all sharks have to keep moving in order to survive. Our, our nurse sharks and our white tip reef sharks, as you saw in the one video, can rest on the bottom. Also, um, other species can, even the obligate ram ventilators, can often do fine being held still alongside the boat. As long as they're in water, they can get oxygen just from ambient water flow into their mouth and out over their gills. It seems like the bigger your mouth is, the better off you are in that situation. So animals with really big mouths compared to their body size, like tiger sharks and bull sharks, uh, can handle that for longer than, say, like a hammerhead that actually has a pretty big body size but a relatively small mouth uh, for their body size. So um, we try to do most of our tagging in less than five minutes. Um, Sometimes it goes a little bit longer, especially when we're starting a new study or working on a new boat and we have to get the kinks worked out. Um, the first couple might take us a little bit longer, but um, yeah, usually five minutes or less. Yes? Good question. How do, how, do, how do researchers avoid conflicting with each other and studying the same things? Um, they don't always. Sometimes they do uh, conflict with each other. Most of the time, it, it tends to go pretty well. Scientists, um, scientists can be a, you know, a disagreeable bunch, but uh, at, least, at least in the shark world, I found that they tend to get along pretty well. Um, especially, especially if you're studying things like nurse sharks or black tip sharks. Everybody's really friendly. You start studying white sharks, you got to watch out. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the scientists, not for the, not for the sharks. Dr. Skolman can tell you about that. But um, uh, for the most part, it's just communication. And a, and a good example is for my dissertation work, I was studying white tip reef shark population genetics. So I was emailing everyone I could find all over the world who might have tissue samples or DNA samples from white tip reef sharks. And in the process, 
I was directed towards a guy who was a grad student in Australia who was doing a PhD dissertation on white tip reef shark population genetics and was emailing everyone in the world he could to try and get samples of white tip reef sharks. So that was definitely a uh, disconcerting moment when you, you sort of discover your doppelganger who's, who's trying to, it's like, well, how far along are you? Well, I don't know, how far along are you? Um, but fortunately, in that case, we, we, were, both, we, we were both very uh, nice guys, and we communicated about it, and we combined forces. We just instantly said, okay, this makes, we should totally work together, and I'll focus on Hawaii and the Eastern Pacific, you focus on Australia and, and uh, try and get some Indian Ocean samples and things like that. So that, that worked out great, but it could have easily, you know, it could have turned into a bad situation, but people have to be decent. We used to be decent, yes. <laughs> if you were designing a next generation of tag, what would you measure? What, what measurements would you have? Oh, wow, if I were designing a next generation of tag, what would I measure? I mean, some of the next generation of tags are already out there, and it's mainly an, uh, making them more um, readily available and easy to use. So there's there's version of tags that have uh, accelerometers, uh, they have a compass, so you can tell what heading the animal is actually on. Uh, they have uh, flow flow meters, so you can tell how fast the animal is moving through the water. Uh, they have cameras. Cameras are nice. Um, so you can see what the animal is actually doing, but cameras also turn out uh, to take up a lot of battery and memory and, and aren't that useful in most, most marine environments. You know, you can't actually see that much. Um, and just what they typically put them on a shark's dorsal fin and they're pointing forward, and so you're only seeing what's right in front of the shark. And many times, if not most of the time, the shark is behaving or reacting to things that are not immediately in front of it. They're, they're off to the sides, they're sensing things with their lateral line, they're hearing things. Um, but so yeah, there's, there's also some really cool tags. Actually, Dr. Skomel probably talked about this. Some of the tags that uh, put on sharks and then are designed to be followed by an uh, autonomous vehicle so that they can actually track these sharks with drones and follow them around. And every once in a while, the shark will zoom in and sort of take a couple pictures, or sorry, the AUV will zoom in and take a couple pictures of what the shark is doing or video and store that data and then back off again. And that's, that's fascinating stuff. That's really cool uh, stuff. Although in Dr. Skomel's case, the white shark, I think, turned around and tried to eat the AUV <laughs> a couple of times. And they don't necessarily like being followed by strange robots. So, um, but yeah, those are the kind of things that I think are really cool. How much do the tags that you work with cost? Good question. The tags that I work with cost, uh, so these actually just came down. They, we get them from a company in the UK, the accelerometers themselves. They used to be about $1,700. Now they're about $850 each. Our whole package, our whole tag package is probably about eleven dollars or $1,200 altogether, um, which is really phenomenal because most of the satellite tags that people have used in the past for this post-release mortality type research are $4,000 a piece. Now they have some, some cheaper versions that are only $2,000 a piece. But you pay $2,000 and it's one-time use and you find out that uh, some of the tags just send you back information like sank, floated, you know, <laughs> very little information for your $2,000. Uh, whereas in our case, our tags are much cheaper. We can keep using them as often as we get them back. And we get very fine scale information telling us, okay, this shark died at this time, was then eaten by another shark. You know, we get really, we can also tell for the animals that survive, we can tell their, how long it takes them to recover. Uh, you'll see that when they first get released, they're swimming a little bit wonky. But then after, with black tips, it's about 10 hours before they recover and start swimming normally again. So we get a wealth of data uh, back, really cool stuff for cheaper than a satellite tag with the only catch being that we have to go out on the water and find all these tags and get them back after we put them on the sharks. Uh, up in the back in the dark, I can almost see you. Has the shark finning industry had any effect on my data? That's, that's a good question. In, in the United States, there is no shark finning industry. There's, there's shark fishing industry, but finning itself, which refers to the practice of catching sharks at sea, chopping their fins off, and, uh, and throwing the carcasses overboard. 
that's been banned in, in the U.S. for uh, many years now. So any fisherman in the U.S. would be, in U.S. waters that we work with, would be catching sharks and landing them with, with fins attached. Um, and I would say I can't think of a single one of our tags, tag sharks that has been caught by a fisherman, um, only because our accelerometers are usually on for just a few days at a time at most. So over that short of a period, it's unlikely they're going to be caught again. We've had other tags. Uh, we've worked with people who put satellite tags on sharks that are more long term that have definitely been caught by fishermen. Often it's uh, uh, fishermen overseas across the Atlantic, people coming out from Europe and, and fishing and catching like makos and things like that. Um, I had some of my white tip reef sharks in Hawaii caught by recreational fishermen uh, who ate them. And uh, white tip reef shark you wouldn't think would be that tasty, but they ate them and uh, and yeah, I only found out about it because someone happened to see them pull it up on pull it up on the beach and saw the tag number and and let me know a few weeks later. I'd been wondering where that shark was. It's on somebody's dinner plate. So. Uh, yes. Yeah, good, good question. Yes, and it's, it's right here. So he's, he's asking about the corrosive link that we use on the shark's fin to attach to the tag, and does the rest of the strap come off? So the, <laughs> very good, Mark. So the rest, of, the rest of this is a pretty standard cable tie that you would get in the hardware store, and it's, a, it's attached. We, we have backs on the fin that it uh, catches like an earring, like the back of an earring. And doing this tagging is a lot like getting your ear pierced. We make two holes in the fin. Um, you know, if someone pierced your ear without you requesting it, that's what it would But when, when this thing corrodes, it does still leave these, these pieces of cable tie on the fin, but we found that they work their way out of the fin. Um, we've, that's just from some captive studies we've done, and we've had one nurse shark in the dry tortugas that we put an accelerometer on that was then recited again the next year because the males tend to come back every year, the females come back every other year, and its fin was perfectly clean. There were no, no zip ties attached. So um, we, we released that and are optimistic that that works its way off eventually. If you were trying to get, if you were attaching a tag, this, if you're trying to get a zip tie to stay on a fin uh, for many years, you wouldn't attach it this way. This would be a really bad way to do it. So we, we tell ourselves that the fins are totally clean at some point afterwards. Um, and we have a little bit of evidence that that's the case, not a lot. Okay. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Nick for a fabulous talk. Thank you very much. Nick. Thank you again uh, very much, everyone, for joining us for the last lecture of the spring.